Hello, welcome to the midweek video uh, as we continue to study 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, we're not meeting at the building this evening. If you're watching this, probably it's already 7 o'clock, so uh, you wouldn't have been coming anyway. But I just want to say that. And then we still have our signups that we need people to take a look at. Uh, nursery, we need um, two people per service uh, for the four weeks every month, plus when there's a fifth week. The Sunday school and the worship service. So let's continue to get that filled up uh, as we have uh, some babies in the church family. Then mowing sign up. That uh, there's still some slots uh, there for that. If anybody is interested in that. And then also the August and September cleaning sign up is also on the table out in the lobby. So please take a look at that. And thank you for your faithfulness and ministry in that. That's pretty much it for uh, announcements right now. So I'm going to go ahead and switch the screen. We're not going to have a song today. Uh, so I'll just jump right into uh, the PowerPoint and the study of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 through 28. So here it is. As you can see on your screen, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 through 28. The urgency of the times compels us to remain as we are. Uh, new part uh, in the outline. I don't know if anyone pays attention to these outlines, but they can, they, for some people, they help get their minds wrapped around Paul's flow of thought. Uh, so we're on number three, and it's about virgins. Paul says betrothed in the verses, uh, but the Greek word means virgins, and he's specifically using it about those who are planning on being married. Singleness is preferable, but not required. That's where we are tonight. And then Paul's reasons for singleness, and then, but marriage is no sin. So we'll be uh, in those three categories the next few weeks. Let's look at the introduction. In these verses, Paul continues with his general theme of chapter 7, how we deal with staying in or changing our current situations in light of who we are in Christ and how we live for him in this world. The whole idea has been stay as you are with some caveats that he gives. Specifically, he again addresses different circumstances people would be in related to marriage and encourages the Corinthians to stay as they are. He adds that it is not a sin for the betrothed to marry, so that's virgins planning on getting married. Uh, our terminology would be engaged. Yet does stress that his reasoning for his encouragement to remain unmarried is because of the attention marriage requires and the gravity of the times. Let's look at the verses. We will include verses 29 through 31 also for context. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as, those that, as though they had no dealings with it. But the present form of this world is passing away. All right, let's look at the questions. Any initial observations, thoughts, or questions, as always. Then secondly, how would you briefly describe the passage? The urgency of a life devoted to the Lord calls us to think deeply about remaining as we are, even in relation to someone who may be planning on getting married. Okay, let's look now at these specific questions. Letter A. In verse 25, Paul refers to the betrothed. The Greek word implies virgins, likely females, but it could be either gender who are planning on getting married. Paul is likely answering a question the Corinthians had in their letter. He mentions that in verse 1 about what those who are engaged in our terminology should do. What does he then say in the rest of the verse? What does it mean? And why does this matter? So he says, I have no command from the Lord. He has no command from the Lord, but he gives his judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I forgot to read the verse, so let me read it. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord. But I give my judgment as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. That's what he says. Now, what does it mean? This simply means 
similar to what Paul said in verses 10 and 12, that Jesus did not specifically address this in what is recorded in Scripture. And additionally, Jesus in Paul's communication with him gave him nothing directly related to this. Paul mentions, I believe it's at the beginning of Galatians, how he actually spent time with the Lord in Arabia, uh, kind of getting his doctrine and the basis for his ministry and many of the letters that he wrote. And so whether it's in scripture, whether it's Paul's personal communication with Jesus, he doesn't have anything directly from him. But Paul has the authority of the Lord in his writing. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit, by the Lord's mercy. So why does this matter? This matters because it is authoritative in God's word for the context and anything else. And so contextually, Paul has authority. And then uh, in any other things that he writes or any other Bible writer, uh, the same authority extends to them. Letter B now, Paul mentions the present distress in verse 26. He could be referring to a famine or persecution in Corinth at the time of his writing, but more likely has a more general meaning. What do you think it could be? In light of that, what does he exhort? I believe he's probably referring more to the reality of the present age and the urgency of living in light of Jesus's return. So let me read the verse. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Okay, the urgency of living in light of Jesus's return because of the way the world is. The urgency of the times causes us to live with kingdom and gospel focus. If this was true in Paul's time, it is even more true now. He's speaking of whether to marry or not, but there are broader implications, just the way we order our lives and the way we think about um, laying up treasures in heaven and um, the things that we uh, pay too much attention to here on this earth or our priorities. So a lot of broader implications. And then in light of that, what does he exhort? He says that it is good for believers to remain as they are. He says in verse 27 that, that should be if, that if someone is not married yet, they should stay that way. If they are married, they should stay that way. Verse 27, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. So he's saying, even for those who may have been planning on getting married officially, because of the times and the urgency of a life singularly devoted to the Lord and having kingdom and gospel focus, Paul says it's good to remain as you are um, so that your treasure and your priorities and your focus can be totally to the Lord. So this is pretty radical thinking, um, but again, he's saying I have the authority to be saying this. Now letter C, what does he add for clarification positively and negatively in verse 28? Verse 28, but if you do marry, you've not sinned, and if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Okay, so it's not sinful to marry. Paul isn't trying to reverse God's design for life and relationship. And so there could be those who are planning on getting married. They hear this message from Paul, and they're like, no, wait a minute. We feel like God wants us to do this. He's saying, fine, do it. It's not sinful to marry. And obviously, he's already said, you are married, stay married. He's merely emphasizing the magnitude of a life singularly devoted to the Lord in light of the times. The reason he believes it is good for the engaged to not marry is all of the elements that require someone's attention when married, because he says, going on in verse 20, 28, yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. Again, this is not wrong, but his focus is on something like a wartime mentality. He's saying when you're married, naturally you have to devote much of your attention and, and all these other things to the one to whom you're married, which is right. It's God's design. But in the context of this um, of time being short and living in light of the Great Commission and uh, seeking Jesus's return, all of these things, this idea of a wartime mentality to have a life that you um, don't have to devote to anything else like Paul himself. Paul is saying is a good thing. So wherever we are, before we look at this next question, not married, married, uh, certain situations in life, the principle remains that in light of the times, we take them seriously and live as we are in devotion to the Lord, seeking to honor him and glorify him and make much of him and bring others into the kingdom and uh, live in light of the kingdom and our king.
So how does this passage point us to Jesus? And how can we live in his grace in the context of it? Just five ideas that I have here. Paul's authority or anyone or uh, it should say any other, any other writers in the Bible is Jesus's authority because of inspiration. So he says, yes, I don't have this directly from Jesus, but I have been given this authority. I'm trustworthy. And so it's um, it's compelling. And the same thing would apply to anyone else who writes in Scripture because they're inspired by the Spirit. Second, Jesus gives the grace to remain as we are. And especially as Paul's writing this, maybe someone who was engaged, you know, this man who's betrothed to a virgin, they're planning on getting married. And Paul's saying to you, you need to think deeply about this. And if that would be maybe something the Lord would lay on their heart, Jesus gives the grace to remain as they are. Uh, and Jesus gives the grace to remain as you are if you're married, whatever circumstance we're in, even if it goes against our own ideas of the way our lives should be ordered. Whatever state we are in is his current, and sometimes it changes. We seek job advancements, et cetera, et cetera. But whatever state we are in is his current will and gift. Third, he's in control of the times, even as we look at them and see the urgency. And so if Paul was able to say it 2,000 plus years ago, or around 2,000 years ago, we would say the same thing now. Look at the times. Uh, the return of Jesus seems nearer, and so let us live with that urgency. But he's in control of it. And so that matters in relation to presidential elections and our own lives and on and on and on. Whatever state we are in, number four, he is to always be our surpassing treasure and focus. And so that informs where we find ourselves, whether unmarried, married, whatever. And number five, marriage is from the Lord, is ultimately about him, and is enabled by his grace. And so as Paul's talking to the married and saying, stay as you're married, stay as you are married, matters there. Uh, and it also matters to those who are planning on getting married. Okay, so that's the passage for this evening. Let me take just a few minutes to uh, go over some prayer requests and pray with you. I am going to take uh, just a couple of minutes to pray. I don't have anything new uh, that is not on the bulletin, but we want to continue to be praying for Barbara that she'll heal completely for Lee uh, as she navigates life without Tom. And uh, for Matthew Loop, we're pray, praising the Lord that his back is doing better. Uh, you can make sure that you are grabbing a bulletin. Uh, I do want to be praying for our fishermen as they're gone in Prince William Sound and in Bristol Bay. And then also the Salmonsons, uh, those who are gone for the summer. Thanking the Lord that God has brought us uh, some uh, new folks recently. And just uh, want to pray that we'll be a blessing to them. So let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Father, for your wisdom and the truth and the authority of your word and how it speaks to us no matter what our circumstance. I want to give these requests to you. Thank you that you have healed Barbara. She's out of the hospital. Please heal her completely. She won't have any more lingering issues with her lungs or her heart. Uh, we pray for Lee that you will continue to give her the grace and comfort that she needs. And uh, also thank you that uh, Matthew's back is doing better. Thank you that you've been bringing people to us recently. May we be a blessing to them. And I do pray for the Box and the Veals and others as they're down in Bristol Bay and John and Prince William Sound and then the Salmonsons. We just pray for them. Um, all the other things we have going on during this summer. And we just praise you for the fact that you hold uh, on to us, that we are safe, um, that you are a surpassing treasure. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks for watching. I hope to see everyone this Sunday. So have a great rest of your week.